For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. This chapter, it talks a lot about the blood. Obviously, if you're listening to the songs, you might have got an inkling of what I was going to preach tonight. The title of my sermon is The Blood Atonement. The Blood Atonement. It's actually a very fundamental doctrine, a very simple doctrine, a doctrine upon which I hope a lot of people have even heard before. Maybe they, they've heard this many times. But as I was thinking about fundamental doctrines, I think today it's very important that we understand what's fundamental. Do you understand that, hey, I'm a fundamental Baptist, what does that mean? It means I understand the simple truths of the Bible. It means I believe the core doctrines of the Bible. You know, the, that is salvation by faith. That our name of our Savior is Jesus Christ. That, you know, the virgin birth, eternal security, the King James Bible, these things, heaven and hell. And we need to, know, we need to be more rooted and grounded on the fundamentals. And you say, well, I've already heard this. I think anytime you hear a fundamental doctrine, you should put yourself in this mode to think of, well, where am I at with this fundamental doctrine? Okay, you've heard it, but that's just stage one. How about, do you know it? Do you know the doctrine? How about stage two? Have you memorized the doctrine? Could you point to a lot of verses that prove the doctrine? How about a fourth point? Moving on where you're doing the doctrine. Where you're actually going out and fulfilling the commandments or fulfilling whatever that doctrine is or preaching it. The last one, what if you're teaching it? So you say, well, I've already heard this doctrine before. Well, do you know it? Have you memorized it? Are you teaching others? Are you going out and doing it? So maybe that's why you've got to hear that, that doctrine again and again. So that we can move past just hearing. We shouldn't just be forgetful hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Amen. So there's a stage, there's an evolution. You say, oh, I've already heard this doctrine. Well, maybe it's just to get you, you know, more knowledgeable. Or maybe memorize even more about it. Or maybe be doing more with it. Or maybe even teaching it unto others. It's very important that we understand what it means to, to, to understand the fundamentals of the faith. The fundamentals of, of being a Baptist. But today the fundamentals are being attacked. Even just the name of our Savior. And I'm going to give an anecdote. I wasn't prepared in my sermon but Sam Gipp was preaching a sermon against our church and against our pastor. And he got up and he said that he doesn't even think Jesus Christ was the original name of our Savior. A very foundational doctrine of the Bible. And the pastor of this church, he didn't even rebuke Sam Gipp. He got up and just said, oh, Sam Gipp, good sermon, whatever. So I looked up this Keith Gomez. And I, I tried to get a little bit of information on him. And I looked at a sermon that he was preaching about salvation. He was preaching about the gospel. And this is a quote that I found from this video. He said, he's talking about the Jews. And he turned, to, he turned to James chapter 2. And he was saying, well, James chapter 2 clearly teaches that faith alone doesn't save. Work saves. <laughs> he says, but you've got to understand who he's talking to. And he tries to say that the whole book of, of James is only written to the Jews. And so in that context, he says, you've got to understand, but in the Old Testament, they had to believe that the Messiah was to come and then they had to perform an act to prove that. That's why they slay the lambs. That's why they had the sacrifices. So Dr. Keith Gomez, or Pastor Keith Gomez, believes that in the Old Testament law, the Jews also had to do works to be saved. He doesn't believe the gospel for the, for the Jews in the Old Testament. But if you understand the blood atonement, if you understand the blood of Jesus Christ, you're not going to be confused with that. You're not going to misinterpret the gospel. That's why that guy's a false teacher. He's a false prophet. I mean, you go to his website, he says, you know, you've got to repent of your sins. He's believing in multiple gospels. He's saying, hey, the blood of Christ wasn't good enough for these people. They also had to do works. They also had to do the sacrifices. In Leviticus chapter 17, we read a lot about they have to do sacrifices or shedding of blood. But it made it very clear in verse 11 the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul, it wasn't talking about the blood and bulls. It wasn't talking about the animal sacrifices making atonement. It was talking about Jesus Christ and the future. And as you read the Old Testament, it's just picture after picture of Christ's blood. So first, let's look at what the blood means in the Old Testament. Go to uh, Exodus 29, if you would. Flip back just... Uh, well, I guess... Yeah, flip back to Exodus 29. I'll read for you in verse 33. It says, And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made. 
to consecrate and to sanctify them, but a stranger shall not eat thereof, because they are holy. This is the first time that atonement, that word is used in the Bible. And we see that with the sacrifices, it says that the atonement was supposed to be made where they consecrated and sacrificed them, or sanctified them. Look at verse 15, go down a few verses. It says, Thou shalt also take one ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. And thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood, and sprinkle it round about the altar. Look at verse 20, skip down, it says, And then shalt thou kill the ram, and take of his blood, and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of the right hand, and upon the great toe of their foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. Look at the very first part of 21, And thou shalt take the blood that is upon the altar. So they had the blood on the altar, and he said, look, the atonement was made where? Back where they consecrated and sanctified. Back where the blood was shed. So we see the blood atonement is being foreshadowed here at the very beginning. The first mention of atonement is through the blood. Go to Exodus 30, go one chapter forward. Look at verse 10. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall they make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. So again, we see reference and reference over again. The atonement is made with the blood. Always picturing what Jesus Christ would do. Always signifying what He would do. Go to 2 Chronicles chapter 29, if you would. And I'll read for you in Leviticus. It says in Leviticus 16, it says, And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So even we have the picture of Jesus Christ, what do you do for all believers? He has two goats. One goat's going to be slain. And it's interesting because he says, one lot for the Lord. And then a scapegoat. So we see the, the Lord was the one who was going to be slain. And then everybody else is going to be the scapegoat. They're just going to get off free. What a beautiful picture of what Jesus Christ would do for every believer. In Leviticus 14, there was another uh, picture that was really interesting to me. It said in verse 4, Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean, and cedarwood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it in the cedarwood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. So in the, in the old time sacrifice, they had two birds, and they were supposed to kill one, and then they were supposed to take the live bird and dip him in the blood of the dead bird and let him go free. Just another perfect picture of what Jesus Christ would do, how we're washed and sanctified by his blood and then set free. Just another great picture. Look at 2 Chronicles 29, right here. Look at verse 23. And they brought forth the he goats for the sin offering before the king and the congregation, and they laid their hands upon them. And the priests killed them, and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. So we see here another picture where they bring both the goat offerings for many. Not just for one. A lot of the sacrifices in the Old Testament is talking about one person or this person. We see an atonement was made for all Israel. And we know that the, the blood of Jesus Christ will save all those that believe in Him. Go to uh, Romans chapter 5 if you would. But the Old Testament makes it very clear. All the sacrifices and all the blood atonements, they weren't going to save the people with the, the blood of bulls and goats. They were picturing what Jesus Christ would do. That the Lord would provide Himself a lamb. That the Lord was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Look in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God committed His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. A beautiful verse, a verse I always use soul winning. Look at verse 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received 
the atonement. Look at that. They have received atonement from what? Faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the blood that gives us the atonement. That's how we get washed from our sins. That's how we have reconciliation. That's how we have peace with God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Not through any works of our own selves. Not through anything that we do. Not by living a good life. Not going to church. No, the blood of Jesus Christ gives us the atonement. The blood of Jesus Christ is what washes away all of our sins. Uh, go to uh, John chapter 6. So we see in the Old Testament, all those things were just pointing to the fact that we should have faith in Christ's blood. That we're going to be justified by faith in what He did, His shed blood. So then we kind of fast forward. Let's go to the death of Christ. Let's kind of see. We we're in the Old Testament. Look at John 6, verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Another very good soul winning verse. It says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eateth this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now, of course, the Catholics, they interpret this through transubstantiation where they take alcoholic beverages and try to say, that's turning into the blood of Christ. Drink this and you're going to wash away your sins. You're going to have fellowship with Christ or whatever garbage they want to add. <laughs> but the Bible makes it clear that Jesus wasn't talking about literally eating his, the manifestation of his body. So what does he mean? Well, he's talking about his body being the bread of life. The Bible says man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. We see a lot of times when Jesus Christ referring to His flesh, saying, I'm the bread of life. We know that the bread is representative of the Word of God. And you have to hear the Word of God. You have to eat and consume some of the Word of God in order to get saved. You want to have eternal life, you've got to eat some of the eternal life. You've got to eat some of Jesus Christ. You've got to eat some of His bread. And the same thing is with drinking His blood. We rest in the blood of Jesus Christ. Go to Mark chapter 14. No, I'm sorry. Go to Matthew 26. I'm going to read for you. It says in Mark 14, verse 24, And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, pointing to the Lord's Supper. In Luke 22, it said, Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Look at Matthew 26, verse 26, parallel passage to those other two. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it. And gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So notice in verse 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament. We get the New Testament through the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. Because we don't get a New Testament without the shedding of blood. We'll look at that in a minute. But look also in verse 27. He said, drink ye all of it. So keep here. Keep, uh, don't keep it here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 if you would. I'll read for you from Leviticus. The Bible says in Leviticus 4, when it's talking about those Old Testament sacrifices, it says, And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. In Leviticus 18 or 4.18 it says, And he shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar, which is before the Lord that is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour out all the blood at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. In Numbers 28, the Bible says, And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of a hen for the one lamb. In the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. So you see all these pouring of drink offerings, and he's saying, Pour all of it. 
Pour all of it. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as ye often as have eaten this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So again, look at verse 26. What's the point of the communion? What's the point of the Old Testament sacrifices? What's the point of the blood? It's to show the Lord's death. It's pointing to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that we have remissions of sins through His blood. Why is it drinking the wine so important? Because it's the blood that saves us. It's the blood that washes our sins away. It's the blood that gives us the atonement. We have to understand that it's all through the blood. And when you realize, hey, I'm just resting in the finished work of Christ and His blood, how can you add works to that? How can you add works to the blood of Jesus Christ? But we see those that want to add works... They don't understand the blood atonement. How can you understand that it's all through His blood that you just dip the bird in the blood and just let Him free if it has anything to do with you? Did the bird have to work and do some extra effort? No. He was just dipped in the blood. God just dips us in Jesus' blood and then we're set free. We're like the scapegoat. We just get to go scot free. Nothing that we did. No, the law, the law was in the Lord. He paid the sacrifice. He did all the shed blood. And without the shedding of His blood, there was going to be no atonement. There was going to be no washing away of sins. No remission of sins. And it's interesting that the life is in the blood. He said, you want to have life in you? you got to drink my blood. We get our life from Jesus Christ. Through the blood of Christ, He gives us new life. Go to uh, John chapter 19, if you would. John chapter 19. So we see that we have Him drinking the communion. We see that they're pouring out the blood offering. All these are just showing the death of Christ. So if we go to John chapter 19, we'll actually see the death of Christ. Look in verse 34. But when one of the soldiers with a, pierce, with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And that and he and wow, sorry. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that he might believe. So we see at the at the time of Christ, when he's on the cross. He's there, and it's the end of his life. The, the uh, soldiers come, and they pierce his side, and out comes the blood and the water. Look at verse 35. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. I think that's a really interesting phrasing there. Go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. So he's saying whenever the blood and the water came out, he that saw it bear record... And his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that he might believe. We can believe the gospel because of the record of the blood. The blood gives us a record. Look at 1 John 5, verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. To even believe in the blood atonement, you have to believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. I mean, he wasn't just a spirit. He wasn't just coming and he wasn't a man. No, he was a man because he had blood. That's how the blood could even be shed. It says, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Look at verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. So you see, the record of God has to do with the blood. The blood is even just the record that we know that it's true. The shed blood of Jesus Christ. It bears witness in the earth. We go through and we preach the blood of Jesus Christ as a witness for people to get saved. And we know that this is true because the Spirit beareth record. It, the Spirit is truth. It says, look at verse 6. And this is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. Just matches perfectly what it says in John 19. He that saw it bear record, and his record is true. But there's a lot of people today, they don't believe that. They don't believe in the blood atonement. They reject the blood atonement. They, they walk away from the blood atonement. They attack the blood atonement. They say, ah, well, I know Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he shed his blood, but that's not enough. 
you got to shed your blood too. The Mormons today, they reject the blood atonement. They teach that Jesus Christ's blood was not enough for an atonement. And we need people today to call them out and say they're not Christians. Because they don't believe in the blood atonement. We need people to stand up for the fundamentals of the faith. To stand up and say, no, I believe in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. I mean, can you imagine someone attacking the blood of Jesus Christ? But that's what the Mormons do. And then someone calls out a Mormon, you're like, oh, you're not Christian. No, I'm not a Christian if I don't stand for the blood of Jesus Christ. What gives me the atonement? What washes away my sins? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But you know what? If I just let people just you know, tarnish the blood and speak against the blood, I'm being ashamed of Jesus Christ if I don't want to stand for the faith. If I don't want to stand for the fundamentals of the faith. If I don't want to stand for the blood. We need people today that are going to stand and get excited and preach with zeal what they believe. There's so many people out there, they'll get up and scream and yell and, and tell all their doctrine, and it's false doctrine. It's garbage. It's not true. But they'll get up and they'll scream and yell and say, Oh, I believe, you know, the world's billions and billions of years old. Oh, Joseph Smith, he's the greatest prophet. Don't tell me what to do. We see all these atheists and agnostics say, There's no God. They'll get up and scream it and yell in people's face. We need some Christians to get up and stand. I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what washes away sins. That's what gives forgiveness of sins. We need to look to the blood of Jesus Christ. Not through works. Not through man's effort. And when someone gets up and they start preaching man's effort is going to get them saved. We need to confront them to the face. Say, no, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. No, you're preaching against the blood of Jesus Christ to say, oh, you got to do works too. Oh, you gotta, you got to atone yourself. No, we shouldn't do that. And Keith, you know, this Keith Gomez needs to know Acts chapter 10. Go to Acts chapter 10 for a second. Let's look at this one verse. And then we'll get to the Mormons. Acts chapter 10. Let's go to verse 43. Because he's saying, well, in the Old Testament, you know, it was a little bit different. you got to rightly divide the word of truth. It's just lies and rank heresy. Look at Acts chapter 10 verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now, was Moses a prophet? Was Moses the one who gave the law to the Jews a prophet? He was saying it's just faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in what? Faith in his blood. They had all the blood sacrifices, but they were pointing to what? To faith in Jesus Christ. That's what got them saved. Faith in the blood. Not by performing some kind of work or performing some kind of action. There was plenty of people performing, you know, blood sacrifices that weren't saved. That wasn't proof of their salvation. That wasn't proof of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We even see people, how, how did anybody get saved that wasn't a Jew, if that was true? If back then, the only way to get saved is by faith and performing the animal sacrifices, how did any of you Gentiles get saved? How did, you know, Naaman the Syrian... You know, I believe he probably got saved. Or the Queen of Sheba. Jesus Christ even gives reference to her. How did she get saved in the Old Testament if you had to perform the animal sacrifices to be saved? Well, you see, these people want to get up and they want to deny the blood of Jesus Christ. Because you're denying the blood of Christ if you teach that works is going to save. But I've got some quotes from the Mormons. It's um, from the Journal of Discourses. So there's this online resource. It's something they provide where they just captured a whole bunch of sermons by some of their Mormon leaders from uh, 1851 to 1886. So this is like the pioneers of the faith, the guys that really got it going, like Brigham Young. Here's a quote from their president, Brigham Young, the Brigham Young of Brigham Young University. He said this, There is not a man or woman who violates the covenants made with their God that will not be required to pay the debt. The blood of Christ will never wipe that out. Your own blood must atone for it. He said, look, your sins, they can't be forgiven by Jesus Christ. You have to atone for it. And that's what the Mormons teach. They don't teach in the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't preach that it was precious. They don't preach that that was going to give them the atonement. No, they believe in work, salvation. It's clear the day is long. They're not trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. They don't believe that Jesus Christ's blood gave them the atonement. But go to uh, John chapter 1. Go all the way back to John chapter 1. You know, and I'm not ashamed to call out false gospels, the perversions of Christianity, 
The ones that want to attack the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it's precious. We should lift up the blood of Jesus Christ. We should look with honor and reverence. And we should get these scriptures in our heart and on our mind. So that we don't all just hear them. So we don't just know them. But we have them memorized so that we can do and teach them. Why? Because if you understand the blood of Christ, if you have it on your heart, it's just going to come out from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. That's just going to help you get more people saved. Give more people the gospel. Give them more power. Because there's power in the blood. We don't just sing that because it sounds catchy. No. There really is power in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what saves people. That's what gives people the atonement. That's what we should preach. Look at John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on His name. Another great soul winning verse. But look at verse 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. So it's not your blood that got you saved. No, Brigham Young, who's dead and in hell right now, he's burning in a lake of fire because he didn't put his faith in the blood of Christ. He had faith in his own blood. But the Bible says it's not of blood. It's not through your blood. It's not through the shedding of your own sins. It's not for doing any works. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's of God. That's how you get the atonement. Let me give you another quote from Brigham Young. He says, It is true that the blood of the Son of God was shed for sins through the fall, and those committed by men. Yet men can commit sins which it can never remit. So you're saying, well... Yeah, I mean, he did die for some sins. But you can't commit, like, big sins and expect to be saved. And in the context of this, he's saying stuff like murder, like adultery, you know, things that we would consider to be very big sins. Sins that the Bible says are worthy of death. But he gets confused because the natural man receiveth not the things of God, and he gets confused about capital punishment, about punishments from the government, meaning that that's going to give them atonement to go to heaven. Thinking, well, because he teaches... The Mormons teach that everybody goes to heaven. And they say the only way this guy's going to get to heaven is if we just kill him. Is if we shed his blood. No, shedding his blood is just going to probably send that guy to hell. Because he probably hasn't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you another quote. This is from one of their elders. It says, We may talk of men being redeemed by the efficacy of his blood. But the truth is that the blood has no efficacy to wash away our sins. That must depend upon our own action. I mean, how clear can you get that the Mormons don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? They're not trusting in His blood. They don't believe any of the Bible. I mean, how many verses have we already seen that it's through His blood that we're saved? That we're washed through the blood? That every single picture in the Old Testament is picturing what Jesus Christ did? That we're the scapegoat? That we're the pigeon that gets to just flee? Why? Not because of our own works. Not because of our own actions. What does the scapegoat do? I mean, just the definition of scapegoat means you just get off scot-free. But of course, the Mormons believe that you have to you have to do actions. What is that? Works. But then of course, you know, their, their false doctrine just continues. Because once you get a little off, you don't just stay a little off. You just keep going in the wrong direction. So this guy, I, I, I went through a little bit of his, the rest of this quote just to see what else he said. He said this, talking about Jesus Christ. He came to this earth as a living example of the truth. Of the fact that it was possible that man though weak and feeble, can be exalted, saved from his ignorance, and exalted to the capacity of a God. So the Mormons just clearly teach that, hey, Jesus Christ just gave us an example that if you just live a really good life like Jesus, you can be like him and become a God too. And they say that Jesus Christ wasn't God, he was just a man, just like his father who was a man. And they became gods because they were just so good. Because they just had so many good actions. And the Mormons believe that if you're really, really good, you'll be a God. They really believe that straight out of the Mormon's mouth, right on their website, they believe you can become a God if you're good. You can't ever be a God. And the only way you're going to even be in heaven, become a son of God, is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Not of your blood, but through His. But we see the shedding of blood. It took us from the Old Testament. It took us from the death of Christ into the New Testament. Jesus Christ is talking to his disciples. He's saying, look, this, this cup is representing the New Testament. We're going to go into the New Testament through the blood, through my shed blood. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. But the Mormons are not saved today because they don't have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. They have faith in their own blood. 
They have faith in their own action. They have faith in their own deeds, in their own works. And the only way you can have faith uh, in Jesus Christ's blood is if you realize works has nothing to do with it. You can't, it's a contrary view. If it's all through Jesus Christ's blood, that's no work of my own. I can't go back in time and stop it or add anything to it. Christ's blood has already been shed. He's the lamb slain from the, before the foundation of the world. Romans 3, verse 24, the Bible says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So much to unpack in just these few verses. But the Bible's saying, look, we're, we're saved by faith in his blood. Why? So that we can declare his righteousness. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about the fact that he was perfect. And we have faith in his blood. Why? So that he could be just. But then guess what? He's the justifier of him that what? Believeth in Jesus. How do you get that bloodshed applied to you? How do you get dipped in His blood? By believing in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the only one that's just. He's the only one that has the power to give atonement. And He's going to be the justifier of you if you believe in Jesus Christ. And all those that believe in Jesus Christ, He's going to give them remission. I'm going to go to Jesus and say, I have faith in your blood. That's how I'm going to get justified before God. He's going to look at Jesus' blood and say, well, He was righteous. That's how you're getting to heaven. No works of my own. Nothing to do with me. I mean, Lordship salvation is just destroyed if you understand this. How could you add any of your own works? I wasn't good enough to, to do anything to get to heaven. But if I'm already damned, if the only way I'm going to get there is by being justified by Jesus Christ, what goodness is going to do for me? I mean, if I'm already damned to hell, why do I have to live right if I already deserve hell? If at this point I've sinned and I deserve hell... How much more can I deserve hell? I mean, that's the only thing I can do is deserve hell more. I can't ever get to heaven. I already deserve to go to hell. So the only thing I have a chance for is to look to Jesus Christ's blood and to Him to justify me. That's my only out. I'm already going to hell. I already deserve hell. My goodness or my works or me turning over a new leaf has nothing to do with it because I'm already deserving of hell. If I already deserve it, what, what is goodness going to add to that? If I already deserve to go to jail or some kind of punishment, no goodness is ever going to stop that from getting punishment. Because God is just. What does just mean? Just means He's going to, he's going to provide what's equitable. He's going to do what's fair. But He's going to justify those that believe in Him as a scapegoat. Go to uh, Colossians chapter 1, if you would. Colossians chapter 1. We have to eat His flesh and drink His blood. The Bible said in Ephesians 1, it said, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 2. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So we see in the New Testament, Jew, Gentile, we're all made nigh by the blood of Christ. Not only do we receive the atonement, but we also become fellow heirs of the saints, we become, you know, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. We're, put, we're brought together. We're being, we've been sanctified. We get to go free. The truth will make you free. So that we can, we can worship God in spirit and in truth. Look at Colossians 1, verse uh, 14. And then we have redemption through His blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. So we have redemption today. We've been redeemed. Meaning we're new. We can have a new life. We can go in the New Testament and we can do good things for God because He's washed us in His blood. Because we've been made free from our sins. Because we're made nigh by the blood of Christ. Look at uh, verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now have He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. How great is that? You say, what does it mean to have peace? It means that you're holy, that you're unblameable, unreprovable. 
Holy. Just meaning that perfect. Because he's looking to his blood. Unblameable. Meaning there's no blame that Jesus Christ, that God can, you know, impart on you. Unreprovable. Nothing to rebuke. Nothing to correct. Nothing. In his sight. In God's sight. So we've entered into the New Testament. And we have peace with God. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews is going to, you know, really enlighten this doctrine. When it talks about the blood, talks about what happened with the blood of Jesus Christ, talking about the sacrifices in the Old Testament, go to Hebrews 9, verse 12. I mean, we're just looking at score and score of the Scripture, saying the same thing, same thing over and over. I just want it to be drilled in our minds. Why? Because it's a fundamental of the faith. We need to have the fundamentals drilled into our mind, drilled into our hearts. Why? So they just come out of our mouth. So they come out of our daily life. So we never forget it. So they're bound around our necks. Look at Hebrews 9 verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For of the blood of bulls and of goats, and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled the unclean, sanctifying to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause he was the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all why the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. So there's a ton that we just kind of read. Let's kind of go back. Let's look at verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offered himself without spot of God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? One part of the Old Testament sacrifices, while they were offering sacrifices, you know, daily or, or monthly or at the feast, all these sacrifices was just to purge their conscience. So they get right with God. So they could go back to serving God. But in the New Testament, it's different. So we see that we have blood. The blood of Jesus Christ has accomplished another thing in our lives that we can be sanctified through His blood. Not just redemption of sins, but even our daily sins. So that we can, you know, if we can... Uh, we say that we have no sin, we see ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. When we confess our sins, we have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't have to go down and offer some you know, animal sacrifice. When we become unclean, we don't have to offer some sacrifice to enter in the tabernacle of God. God made us clean. He washed us in His blood. He dipped us in His blood so we can be clean and we can enter with boldness into the tabernacle, into the congregation, into the assembly because of what Jesus Christ did. So it's so much more than just even, you know, eternal redemption, but even just the sanctifying of our daily life. The life that now we can serve God with our whole lives because of the redemption of Jesus Christ's blood. Look at verse 16, though. It says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. He's saying in verse 17, For a testament is a force after men are dead. Now the best way I've heard this explained is I think a lot of people are familiar with a will where someone makes up a document and they say, when I die, I want all of my money to go to my wife. Or I want it to go to my son or my daughter or some uncle. But does that will mean anything until the guy dies? No, it's of no use. He could tear that document up, he could burn it, and write a new one. It doesn't matter. It's only enforced at his death. And then at his death, it becomes law. It becomes the will of him. So we see the New Testament didn't become a force until the death of Jesus Christ. That's when we make the transition from the Old Testament to the death of Jesus Christ and with the shedding of His blood we enter into the New Testament. Look at uh, verse 18. It says, Whereupon neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood. It's interesting because the First Testament, you say, well, where was the blood there? Well, Moses actually killed animal sacrifices and took the blood and 
then he gathered all the people and read them the entire law. So we have the Testament being read. And then he literally sprinkled them with the blood to kind of signify this is we're entering into this New Testament with the shedding of blood. Now I found this interesting. Go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. So we see the people are gathered together and the blood is spread on the people and they enter into the New Testament. Well, we have Jesus Christ. You know, He's standing uh, before the people. He's been delivered. And the people want Him to be crucified. Look at this. what they say in verse 25 of Matthew 27. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. How ironic that the New Testament is entered and they say, hey, why don't you sprinkle us with His blood too? And then we enter into the New Testament. Now, of course, there's a lot of meaning to that, but isn't it just interesting that the First Testament, he sprinkled the blood on the people, and then they say, hey, why don't you sprinkle his blood on us? And we enter into the New Testament. Go to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Go back to Hebrews if you don't mind. In Exodus 24, it said, and he took the book of the covenant and read the audience of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it upon the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So all the words of Jesus Christ, all the New Testament, was sealed and signified with His blood. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So we're not saved by the sacrifices. No, Keith Gomez, the Jews weren't, weren't you know, proving their salvation with the bloods of bulls and goats. If anything, it was just sanctifying so they could enter into the tabernacle. But it's all pointing to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. Why can I even be in church tonight? Why can I even go to church with so much boldness? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Even if I had been unclean, or had committed some sin, or done something wrong, I can come to church because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, there are you know, people that are living disorderly and uncon you know, without conduct that's... Uh, proper for the church and they should be cast out. But someone that's repentant and willing to, you know, uh, confess their sins and get right with God, they can enter into the tabernacle of the congregation by the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't have to offer some blood of a bull or a goat to make reconciliation. No, they can make re reconciliation through the blood of Christ. Look at verse 29. Of how much sore punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. So just because we have the blood atonement, just because we have the scapegoat, just because we've been dipped and been made free, we shouldn't just live in sin. We shouldn't just continue in sin. Even though you'll still go to heaven, even though you're son of God, even though the blood of Christ is atoned for your soul, God's saying, look, you're counting the blood of the covenant unworthy. When you just go out and commit sin. When you just forsake God's word. When you go out and you drink and you fornicate and you commit adultery and you lie and you steal. You're counting the blood of Christ unworthy. Just think about how much you're affecting the blood of Christ whenever you commit these sins. Look at, go to uh, chapter 12. Flip over a couple of chapters. Look at verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So Jesus Christ was the mediator of this new covenant. Look at chapter 13, look at verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that He might sanctify the people with His own blood, suffered without the gate. Look at verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So again, we just see verse after verse after verse. It's all through the blood. It's the blood of the Austin Covenant. It's the blood that sanctifies us. From the beginning all the way to the end. Go to 1 Peter. We're wrapping, we're going towards, we're going through the book of the Bible. We're looking at the blood. We're looking at what it means. We're understanding it's the blood atonement. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now, I love the way this verse is, is worded. It says, unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That just signifies what I was saying. Look, His blood is sprinkled on the people that entered in the New Covenant. 
But what's the first words that happen after that? Grace. The sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you. Why? Because we're not saved by our works. We're not saved by doing something good. No, the blood of Christ gives you grace. Something that you don't deserve. Something that we didn't earn. It's grace unto you. And then once you receive that grace, look at that, and peace. Once you get the grace, then you have the peace. You can't have peace without, with God if you don't have faith in His blood. Receive the grace, now you have peace. And let it be multiplied. Don't count it you know, unworthy by going out and continuing in sin. Look at verse 19. It says, But the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. The blood of Christ is precious. Straight out of the Bible. We need to look at the blood of Christ as something to be worthy, something to be honored, something to be praised. Why are we singing so many songs about the blood of Jesus Christ? Because it's precious. Because it's something to be worthy, to be praised. And He was the Lamb without blemish or spot. He was perfect. That we might declare His righteousness. That He might be just. And the justifier of Him which believed in Jesus. Go to 1 John chapter 1. You say, well, didn't the Mormons say that the blood of Christ saved some sin, but did it save all sin? I mean, did it really wash away all sin or just some sins? I mean, you ask the Calvinists, did Jesus Christ pay for all sins or some sins? Well, just the ones that believe. Well, let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. All sin was forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Revelation. We're going to finish in Revelation. So once we understand what the blood of Christ gives us, it gives us the atonement. It gives us the New Testament. So that we don't have to abide by the laws of the Old Testament. They're gone. We have a New Testament. And that we're sanctified by His blood. Not by going and, and sacrificing some animal on the altar or doing some kind of blood sacrifice for our atonement. No. We get that all through the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth on Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. So we were washed in His blood. Just like that dove dipped in the blood and washed. Go to Revelation 7. Revelation 7 verse 14. And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So you can see, Jesus Christ's blood makes you white, pure, holy, righteous, unblameable, unreprovable in the sight of God. And let's go to our last place, Revelation 12, verse 11. You say, well, how can someone know that they're saved? How can they know that they have eternal life? How can they have, you know, the atonement? Where do we get it? Look at Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We have salvation by the blood of the Lamb. We have eternal life by the blood of the Lamb. We're holy because of the blood of the Lamb. We're unreprovable, we're unblameable because of the blood of the Lamb. And once you understand the blood of the Lamb and its pre how precious it is, how it cleanses us from all sin, you can't get screwed up on works. Once you get that on your heart, we can rest assured in the finished work of Christ and His shed blood as our atonement. I'll, I'll read for you. It said in 1 John, But as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, God, for Your Word. Thank you for Your clear doctrine. Thank you for just repeating it over and over and making it so simple and so plain. Thank you for your shed blood, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was without spot, with no blemish, who was perfect, there was no sin in Him at all, and that through His blood we have redemption. And not only for eternal life, but though, so that we can live a, a clean and holy life, that we can be washed in His blood and live in newness and walk in newness of life. I pray that we get that settled in our heart. We wouldn't just hear it. We wouldn't just know it. But we'd also meditate, do, and teach others the blood of Jesus Christ and the atonement we have through His blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.